네, 그 다음에 다음 연자는 저희가 좀 특별한 연자를 모셨습니다. 약간 저희가 이제 세미로 10주년 행사 같이 하는데요. 이제 어, 그래서 모시기 힘든 분을 모셨습니다. 어, 성함이 네, 정원구 교수님이고요. 영어로는 원 가브리엘 정입니다. 어, 정원구 교수님을 좀 소개드리면 해 어바인 메디칼 스쿨을 졸업하셨고 하버드 대학 병원에서 어, 전공 일을 하셨고 현재 미네소타 의과 대학에서 교수로 재직하고 계시고요. 특히 또 저희 임상 술기 교육 연구에 어, 국제 협력 이사를 어, 하고 계십니다. 그래서 저희 임상 술기 교육 연구회가 이게 국내뿐만 아니라 세계적으로 어, 활동하는 또 유명한 유명한 그런 어, 연구회가 될수 있도록 많은 노력을 <웃음> 해주시는 그런 어, 교수님입니다. 어, 뜨거운 박수로 이제 많이. 어, 네 안녕하세요 그저께 도착해서 한국말을 좀 배웠는데 그래도 안될 것 같아서 이제부터는 영어로 시작하겠습니다 그래서 내년은 10년이잖아요 SEP가 그 10년을 위해서 이제 일본에서 그리고 미국에서도 이제 손님들이 오셔서 이 강의를 할 건데 그 강의를 영, 보통 영어로 할까 이건 연습이고 그냥 습기가 되기로 부탁드립니다 죄송합니다 I'm going to talk about the future of emergency clinical procedures. Specifically, I just want to talk about the context where you as uh, emergency physicians, uh, either as residents who are going to be the future of emergency medicine, I thought that this is something you might be interested in. Uh, and I'm not going to talk specifically about a lot of different things. And I want to thank Dr. Chung, who spoke before me, because he really, I think, got into some of the sort of frontiers of what, they're, what we are capable of doing in emergency medicine, and especially in Korea, because I think in some of the slides I'll show that Korea is much more advanced than in America or in, uh, in Europe uh, in terms of clinical procedures. But I think with that comes a price. The price is basically time. As you can recognize that more you go into other specialties and start taking some of their procedures, you'll notice that you will be stuck doing that for a longer time. So the big question is what to do. And hopefully I can share some of our experiences and how to get some more time out of your life. Okay? So without further ado, I think it was already been introduced. But one thing that I want to just talk about and touch upon is the bottom right, the international EM education. Uh, we've started in the University of Minnesota a small office where we're working with uh, physicians in Japan, in Osaka and Okinawa. And in Japan, the emergency medicine system is not um, well developed. So there are only few centers and few cities in Japan that are really doing uh, Western-styled emergency medicine, or in this case, Korean-styled emergency medicine. So their, their doctors and physicians there are really looking to United States to provide education. But I was just really wondering that Korean, of course, is right next door. It's very close. And I think the cultural fit is very close to Japan. So I think it would make sense for uh, that kind of co corroboration to occur between Japanese and maybe Korean physicians. And that's something I'm really hoping. So stay tuned. Hopefully, within the next few years, um, I would love to have a couple of J Japanese physicians visit us and uh, maybe partake in our conferences. I think that should be something we'll work on. Um, but aside from that, so what is the future of EM procedures? Um, I think that a lot of us basically think about EM procedures in something really fantastic, like whether it's a robot that's capable of doing everything, like Uber of medicine, right, or handheld ultrasound, where it could be a microscopic uh, surgery, or it could be virtual medicine. I think all those things are capable, but if you think about it, take a one step back and look at the big picture, you have to wonder where is this all coming from, right? And that's one, something that I want to sh share with you. Um, another thing that I want to tell you about is while I was doing my, uh, while I've been at University of Minnesota, I decided to go to business school, so I have an MBA, and what that's been helpful is to really look at what are the different things and put everything in a context of what are the, some of the further developments. Okay? Am I going too fast or is this okay? It's okay? <laughs> okay. So I think there are two drivers, really, when it comes to innovation. The innovation, I think, comes from the cost and technology. 
So technology on the upper right is higher complexity and it also associated with higher cost, right? And as the uh, things get developed and they get cheaper and cheaper, they become lower complexity and lower cost, right? So it basically arrow goes up and down the thing. Of course, you can develop something and as things get more complex and they get more expensive, and if you're in the business, that's the business that you want to be in. You want to be on the upper right because that's where more money is. And if you're a consumer, you want to drive it down to lower cost and lower complexity. And that is the tension. And it's a beautiful thing because, so if you think about writing technology in 1986, right, you have basic typewriter. I bet most of you probably have never even seen that before. And I was in high school when I started using the typewriter. And in college, I changed to basically what is electric typewriter, okay? For about five years, that was the biggest thing, and everyone had that. Now you go beyond that, what was very expensive was the first Mac. I remember the first Mac, I think it was about $5,000. Now you could buy a Mac for $1,000, and you could buy a PC for 500 of course. So what happened during that time? What happens is that things get simpler, and they get moved down, right? So then slowly, after about 10 years, we have basically electric uh, typewriter, right? And then you basically have a Mac, which is getting cheaper, a lower complexity, and finally, in 1996, the top was basically the Mac OS, right? So this is a theme that you will see throughout the whole thing. So how about a phone technology? In 1986, I remember still having this at home. I remember using it, and I remember calling people, and you had took a long time to dial up. And now we basically, in 1986, the push button was the biggest thing. And the first handheld cell phones and that was the, my father had one of those, and I thought it was the best thing, right? Because he was like carrying around this brick, and he just thought that he looked really cool carrying around. Now everyone has that, right? And in 1996, what happened? It kept sliding down, right? And then finally, the flip phone. So when the Motorola flip phone came out, I thought it was also the biggest thing. So how do we translate this into medicine? So look at the medical technology in 1986. So think back, and this is probably when some of you were born, I think, right? So when you were born, like very lower cost, lower complexity, you still have the stethoscope. I still use that every day, but it's been replaced by a whole bunch of different things, right? So what was the moderate complexity back then? It was an x-ray machine. So x-ray machine, really, it was something that it was just basically being used almost everywhere, but it was moderate complexity, and then in emergency medicine, we use that all the time, and we still do today. And the CT had just arrived on the scene and the MRI, and it was being used in multiple places. And you could imagine, this never went away, but what happens in medical technology is we love our tools, right? Procedures, we love our tools, we love everything that about them, they just end up sliding down. X-rays got cheaper, the CT, and then you started having an ultrasound machine, right? Now, this is a picture of an ultrasound machine from 1996. And we've come a long way, but again, keep, things keep sliding down. And how about in 2006, 10 years ago, what are the, some of the things that we're looking at? We still have the uh, stethoscope. X-ray machine is still being used. We have the CAT scan, and things keep sliding down. Ultrasound is moderate in complexity. And this is only 10 years ago. And now we started getting basically bedside ultrasound, which is something unheard of. And not only bedside ultrasound, we have a color graphics using the ultrasound. So as you can imagine, the technology keeps sliding. So technology and medicine, the innovation flows down that way. So things that are complex and higher cost, they get developed, and then they get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and goes down. So if we can assume that the complexity, okay, and the cost is at the same curve, then we can just bring it all collapse in one side. And basically, what I think is the beautiful thing is emergency medicine is a great place to be there. So the father bear, the other specialist, they have a higher complexity in cost. The lower complexity in cost, but the mama bear, it was too cold, right? And there's non-MD providers that we'll get to in a moment and who they are. And those include PAs, EMTs, and nurse practitioners and nursing staff. And Emergency medicine, I believe, is right in the middle, which is a great place to be. Now, let me share some of the things with you on what we found. So, for example, in the old days of cardiology, okay, so I'm just going to talk about CPR, right? That's the current one. 
what we do is EMTs uh, out on the field doing, uh, car, doing CPR. We read the EKGs, right? I know that a lot of EMTs can read them, but for most part, I believe it's the emergency physicians who read the EKGs, and we make a decision on whether to admit the patient or we basically send them home. And now, the, in the olden days, just a few years ago, the echocardiogram or ultrasound was really dedicated to people who are cardiologists and the specialists. And what's happened since then, and also catheterization, what's happened since then is things started just basically moving down. So today, EKGs in America are read by EMTs out on the field, and they make a decision to call the cath lab. If they see a STEMI, they just stop, and they just basically call directly into the cardiologist, and they tell them STEMI's on their way and get their uh, stable room ready. They can also start making decisions to admit or not. So low-risk chest pain, which I think everyone here agrees is a difficult uh, diagnostic criteria, with the advent of troponin and the bedside ultrasound, the EMT, some are making a decision to transport or not to transport some of these patients to the hospital. So with those rapid diagnostic tools with the bedside, they're making that kind of decision too. So again, because of technologies that, which is getting cheaper and simpler, the non-physician providers are able to use that in the field or in the hospitals. And then of course the echo and the catheterization, those tools are being adopted by emergency physicians and I think that's where, again, Korea is really good about that, is taking the top and sliding it down, right, for our own purposes. So how about pulmonary? What does that look like? So mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, right, which, of course, you could decide that is not a good thing. And emergency physicians, we know about RSI intubation, right? That is our bread and butter, okay? So we know that and we practice that all the time. And ECMO is in the, usually in the confines of people who are the pulmonologist. But again, what's happening is that it's sliding, sliding down. The EMT is providing a life support for intubation. It's being done on the field. And not only that, the ECMO is being used uh, by us rather than the pulmonologist. So specifically, in America, in emergency medicine, we've just started using ECMO. While I know that in Korea, you've been using for quite a long time. So again, I believe Korea is in a much better place to take from what's higher complex and higher cost and bring it down than uh, the Americans have been. So how about in orthopedics? The, just basic splinting, EMTs, right? And we provide the splinting and the reductions, right? And open fractures are usually done by the orthopedist, so we end up calling them. I think what's going to continue to happen is going to again slide down, where I believe that EMTs within the hospitals can provide the splinting, and they can provide the reductions while we provide the airway support and sedation. Meantime, the open wounds like that, where they usually have to go to OR, they'll basically get um, be seen by emergency physicians. Again, this is something that's going to And same thing for trauma. Probably they could provide a Band-Aid, right, and lacerations, and, you know, quite a bit you can do, right? So DLPs, as well as the ultrasound and laceration repairs, and finally burr holes. These are the all confines of usually the trauma surgeons, right? And you could do a release and the complicated laceration repairs. For the specialist to be in that, neurosurgeons, uh, ophthalmologists, or plastic surgeons, while we have the emergency medicine in the middle, what I believe what will happen, it will continue to shift downward, right? So the simple lacerations and simple determination with a fast, all that I believe will be done by the EM EMTs. So right now in our hospital, we have technicians, so EMTs, who are providing simple laceration repair and simple casting and simple uh, splinting, they do all that, which leave us, the physicians, to do more higher complex stuff, right? So whether it's a multi uh, lacerations that looks hard to do or releasing some opho or certainly burr holes, we have not done burr holes. Again, I think that's where I could see the SCPE, 
getting into that as we basically progress on for the next 10 years. And same for radiology. It certainly has been a very fun place, right, radiology, because you start with x-rays, CAT scans, ultrasounds, and certainly MRIs, and interventional radiology, as Dr. Chung. So the interventional radiology and reading of MRIs usually are done by the radiologist while we have the middle. I believe, again, simple thing, it will be not only be shifted, but I believe it will be quite expanded to include MRIs, and we'll be doing cath labs. So how do we put all this together? I believe what will happen is that the medical care itself will be disrupted. So disrupted means that it will break apart, I think, what we're doing now as we move forward for the next 10 years. Here's the, some disrupting medical care. So everyone, anyone, anyone use Google Glasses? So my friend had Google Glasses, and it was really incredible, not for what it is, because I don't think it was really produced well, but what it could do in the future. The fact that you can get augmented reality by seeing what it's seeing, it could tell you what's happening. So imagine if you were able to work with this within emergency medicine, or you give these glasses to people who are basically out on the field, and you can be the brain while they be your hands and your eyes, right? Same with uh, telemedicine. Now, telemedicine is something that's very taking off right now in America, where you're providing ICU care as well as just general emergency care while out on the field in the small places where they don't have physicians in those things. The nurse practitioners or PAs are seeing them. So this is where I see the future going. And then finally, something like, again, augmented reality or virtual reality, where you're providing both education and looking through what can be done. Like, let's say you've never done a procedure before, right? Can you imagine someone just walking you through using augmented glasses of how to do it, whether it's a program or an actual person? So those kind of things, I believe, is what's going to come. And I believe that this will disrupt the medical care for quite a long time. How about clinical education? What can be disrupted there? And this is what I was leading up to, is that I think Korea is really good about, or you Korean emergency physicians are really good about taking what the other specialists are doing, which are complicated, and bring it down for the use at the bedside. And I think that's fantastic, and I think that's terrific, because us Americans are not as good with that, because there are a lot of boundary issues between the specialist and emergency medicine, so they do not want to give up their power. So that's been a challenge. But what America is really good at, I believe, is providing the supervision and education to the non-physician non providers. So we have PAs, physician assistants, we have nurse practitioners, we have EMTs within the uh, emergency medicine setting who's providing all the basic things that we can provide, but it doesn't make sense because now we want to go up the value tree, right? Do more complicated stuff and complex stuff, and that's what we're doing. So the PAs, nurse practitioners, and EMTs, we're hiring them to provide basically lower complex and lower cost um, procedures and things uh, to, and service to our uh, patients. So right now we have over a million physicians in the United States close to 100,000 physician assistants, and they have the fastest growth in the last 10 years of any profession. There almost was about, whoop, there was almost about uh, 60,000 10 years ago, and now they've almost doubled, okay? So what's interesting is that while nurse practitioners can be independent, the EMTs need physician supervision, and the PAs need a physician supervision. So I believe that we as emergency physicians are in a perfect place to provide that, whether it's through telemedicine or virtual medicine or through education. Really, they can be your hands and your eyes while they provide the service, either on-site or in the hospitals, which leaves you to really do the hard stuff, right? Whether it's uh, radiology interventional stuff, which will take you away from the ER. So I could imagine Dr. Uh, Jung here who basically is in the uh, ER and he's working, a lot of patients are coming in, you can't take two hours to go upstairs to do an interventional, right? Unless you have those other systems in place, right? 
to take care of those patients who are coming in with simple lags and other complaints, which I believe can be taken care of by the non-physician providers. So what does this mean? Our takeaway is that I believe the cost and technology will really drive future innovation. And again, emergency medicine is a great place to bring expensive technology to the point of care, which is bedside, for use at any time, because otherwise it's just useless. The emergency medicine really takes out the magic of procedures, because I think sometimes when patients see it's really magical, right? You have a laceration that just looks really bad, but afterwards it looks fantastic. They, to them, it's just very magical. But I believe that we provide the science behind the magic, and that can be taught to the non-physician providers who really is going to be our extenders. And then finally, disrupt the clinical education and delivery, right? By supervising non-physician providers to extend physician reach. So what I can imagine in the next 10 years is that there might be a three track, right? You have a basic for someone who's basically starting out EMT. You have the middle and you have advanced. So the advanced clinical procedure and education will really will be for physicians like yourself who are doing really complex stuff. But the middle part will be for the physicians who are starting out or for PAs or for EMTs who've done the basic. Now they want to learn more. And that's what I can envision coming up, is that not there will be two tracks, but there will be somehow three tracks for a lot of different people. So those are my thoughts. And I was just curious if you have uh, your thoughts. Please share with me. I think in America it's very casual. <laughs> and finally, thank you. <laughs> 건강이 감사드립니다. 아, 많은 얘기를 해주셨는데 그 혹시 플로어에서 질문 혹시 뭐 영어로 질문을 드려야 되나요? 예, 영어로 해도 괜찮고 한국말로 해도 괜찮고 예, 편하게 해주시겠습니다. 편하게 안 하셔도 되니까. <웃음> 없어요? 김유세 없어요? <웃음> 예. 저쪽에 뒤에 아, 예. 네, 좋은 질문입니다. 어, 미국에서 있는 EMT는 그 이렇게 따로운 이 서티피케이션은 없고 그 병원마다 다릅니다. 이 우리의 병원에서는 어, 테크니션은 이 프로그램을 짜서 이렇게 6개월 동안 있은 다음에 거기 어, 스플린팅 워크샵하고 로테이션도 좀 하면서 그런 다음에 라스레이션 리페어를 로테이션 하면서 그것만 그렇게 하고 EKG를 하는 방법 그러니까 EKG를 이렇게 EKG 테크니션이죠. 그렇게 사용 지금 하고 있습니다. 그래서 서티피케이션을 그 인원이 있는데 미국은 EMT에서 스테이트에서 서티피케이션이 나오기 때문에 좀 까다로워요. 이게 무슨 말이냐면 이게 미네소타하고 뭐 메릴랜드 같은 데는 완전히 다른 EMT 그 서티피케이션 프로세스 때문에 그 내셔널 이렇게 서티피케이션 바리가 없거든요. 그래서 
어, 지금은 그냥 미네소라에서 그 그냥 병원 안에서만 그렇게 사용하고 여기 미네소라 그 스테이트나 아니면 한국 같이 이렇게 내셔널에서 그 EMT를 그런 거를 하지 말라는 것은 없으니까 우리가 그렇게 계속 하고 있습니다. 그러니까 하지 말라는 법이 없기 때문에 우리가 그 계속 그렇게 하고 사용하고 있습니다. 지금은 그러니까 그리고 우리의 의사의 라이센스 밑에 일할 수 있으니까 그러니까 it's my extension. 그래서 so 그러니까 내 라이센스 이름을 달고 그러니까 그분들이 일을 하고 있죠. 그렇게 하고 있습니다 지금. 네. 제국진. 네. 예. 좋은 어, 질문입니다. 이 미국에서도 어, 다른 스페셜리스트는 우리를 보고 어, 그런 게 있죠. 어, 뭐 질투라든지 아니면 우리의 지금 하고 있는 거 그거를 이제 훔쳐간다. 이렇게 많이 하고 있는데 그래서 더 힘든 것 같아요. 우리 미국은. 그러니까 인터벤셔널 레디아우진 우리는 뭐 생각도 못 하고 그리고 얼트라 사운드도 이제 겨우 이제 들어왔습니다. 그러니까 2, 3년 전부터 이제 이렇게 돈이 들어온다 그 말이죠. 그 전에는 써도 그냥 완전히 에듀케이션만 썼는데 한 2, 3년 전부터 이렇게 메리케어에서 어 그러니까 미국 어 본부에서 이렇게 돈을 주겠다. 이제 배드사이드 어출 사운드 그거를 하기 위해서 참 힘들었죠. 그러니까 그렇기 때문에 한국은 어떻게 보면은 그게 더 쉬운 것 같아요. 왜냐하면 어 벌써 여기 제주도의 닥터 정이 말한 것 같이럼 그냥 하고 싶다. 그럼 할수 있다. 그게 있으니까. 근데 미국은 그렇게 안 되거든요. 이렇게 그 병원마다 닥터 정은 이렇게 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 뭐 10개 아니면 20개 뭐 30개 그런 프로세저만 할수 있다. 딱 나와야 되거든요. 그리고 만약에 내가 레디아로지스트 하는 것을 내가 하고 싶다 하면은 완전히 싸움이 붙어요. 그러니까 그거 우리가 하는 거고 돈이 되는데 왜 그거 훔쳐가냐. 그렇게 큰 싸움이 되면서 어떻게 되냐면 우리 대답은 그러면 네가 24-hour, 7 days a week 환자가 오면 은 와라. 그때부터 이제 시작돼요. 그러면. 그러니까 왜 그러냐면 그 병원에 와서는 그 말이 맞잖아요. 이게 환자는 24시간, 7 days a week 오는데 이 환자의 그 삶이고 그게 the health가 제일 중요하잖아요. 그러니까 그거를 압땡 생기고 그러면 니네들이 그렇게 해라. 안 되면은 그걸 우리한테 주라. 그러니까 보통 미국에서는 그거를 프로바이드 해주지요. 그러니까 그렇기 때문에 우리는 그게 지금 어드밴스 프로세저를 참 힘들어요. 그렇게 그러니까 그걸 찾기가 힘들다 그 말이죠. 하지만 한국은 그렇게 은원이 되면은 보통 뭐라 그래요 그쪽에서 그래도 못 오겠다 그러죠. <웃음> 그못 오니까 이렇게 더 이렇게 심플하게 할수 있는 것 같아요. 여기 한국은 못 오고 안 오고. <웃음> 또 질문 없으십니까? 미국이나 한국이나 똑같네요, 그죠? 뭐 그런 거나 그리고 너무 마, 한국의 사정을 너무 잘 아셔가지고. <웃음> 어, 혹시 질문 있어요? 없으시면 제가 아 예. 예, 그거는 좀 
맞아요. 완전히 드라마죠. 그런데. <웃음> 아니, 케이드라마하고 비슷하잖아요. <웃음> 네, 근데 이하를 그걸 보고 내가 좀 깨달은 것은 그래도 올해도 못 보겠어요. 그러니까 완전히 그 하우스던지 이하는 뭐한 10분 보다가 아, 안 되겠다. 그래서 안 보는데 내가 <웃음> 그걸 깨달은 것은 보통 그게 드라마에 있는 것은 진짜 거의 다 내가 봤어요. 이하를 일하면서. 무슨 말인지 알겠죠? 그러니까 환자가 이게 좀 약간 돌았고 뭐 스토리라인도 좀 이상한 거 그거 거의 다 내가 본 거예요 실제로 하지만 그렇게 뭐 하루마다 다 들어오지는 않잖아요 뭐 일주일마다 한번 아니면 한 달에 한번좀 이상하게 생긴 거뭐와 이건 스토리는 진짜 뭐 테레비에 나온 것 같다 근데 여기도 비슷할 것 같은데 안 그래요? 이거 환자들 스토리 들어보면 야 그거 못 믿겠는데 어디서 <웃음> 한것 같다 그렇기 때문에 하지만 그 이하를 보면서 내가 깨달은 게 이하를 일하면서 거의 다 봤어요. 그 스토리 나오는 것은. 네, 혹시 질문 있습니까? 그 그럼 마지막으로 제가 하나 하면 좀 질문 드리면 워낙 잘 아시니까 저희 나라는 그 아까 강조하신 게 코스트하고 테크놀로지가 굉장히 중요하다고 얘기하셨는데 잘 아시다시피 저희 나라의 내셔널 인슈런스는 굉장히 그 저희가 하는 어, 타임이나 아니면 컴플렉시티나 디피컬티에 비해서 굉장히 많은 저 언더밸류 된그 코스트를 주고 있지 않습니까? 그래서 어, 미국은 저희가 생각하기에는 막연하게는 좀 미, 미국의 응급실도 한 가보고 집중 환자로도 가봤는데 굉장히 코스트나 뭐 그게 높은데 저희는 굉장히 낮단 말입니다. 그래서 뭐 물론 그거는 저희 나라의 문제이고 저희가 굉장히 지금 학회나 술기 연구회나 이런 데서 노력을 많이 해서 이제 올리기 위해서 노력을 하고 있는데 혹시 미국 중에서는 그런 어 내가 한 응급실에서 시행한 프로시저나 아니면 여러 가지에 대한 어떤 어뭐 어떤 스탠다드한 툴이나 뭐 오브젝트한 툴 같은 게 있는 건지 어떤 노력을 하고 계신지 예. 뭐 그런 걸좀 알고 싶습니다. 네, 맞습니다. 지금 말이 맞습니다. 이거 미국 또 지금 저 싸움보다는 그냥 의논하고 여기 뭐냐면 그 ACA라고 오바마가 들어오면서 그 ACA를 그 그걸 낸게 벌써 4년 5년이 넘었죠. 그래서 넘으면서 그게 시작된 게 완전히 코스트 드라이브가 내려가고 그러니까 돈을 이렇게 안 주고 그 다음에 쿼리가 이제 다시 또 올리게 됐습니다. 그래서 그거 어떻게 되냐면 그러니까 네 환자들이 뭐 100명이 들어왔는데 몇 프로가 이게 만약에 누모니아에 들어왔으면 그 엔타바이아스 줄때 얼마나 걸렸나 그리고 엔타바이아스 주고 나서 또 사람 환자들이 살았는가 죽었는가 그런 걸 이제 따지기 시작하거든요. 거기 때문에 그게 완전히 바꿔질 것 같아요. 제 생각으로는 그래서 지금부터는 프로세저 한번 하면은. 그 돈이 나오는데 그러니까 미래는 프로시저 해도 안 해도 그냥 원 프라이스 주겠다 그런 식으로 할것 같아요 그렇기 때문에 그것도 문제죠 어떻게 생각해 보면 네. 그래서 그래서 이게 테크놀로지 이게 슬로프로 이게 가는 이유가 밑에 있는 것은 이게 로우 코스트 로우 밸류는 라이선스를 써서 다른 사람 하면은 이게 타임이 더 프리업 되잖아요. 이게 라스레이션 하려면 뭐 30분, 40분 걸리잖아요. 네. 그거를 생각해서 그지, 다른 네, 환자를 그지. 보고 네. 아니면은 더 컴플렉스 케이스를 할수 있다. 그렇게 생각하시면 더 이렇게 로워 밸류는 나의 라이센스 사용해서 그 돈은 뭐몇 프로 가든지 그렇게 생각하시면 참될것 같아요. 그래서 이유가 이게 네. 두 군데죠. 죄송합니다. 이거 한국말 잘 못해서. 아니요, 아니요. 아니, 그건 컴플렉스 해가지고. 다 알아, 알아. 영어로 엔서 해야 되는데. 예. 김 교수님, 예. 간단히. 예. 전통이 월급이 얼마 정도 됩니까? 네, 그냥 적당합니다. 제가 교수님 전문에 안 물어볼게요. 전통이. 레지던트. 어, 레지던트 전통이. Monthly salary가. Let me see. 음. 요즘에 올라가서 about the 
So, five thousand dollars a month. <웃음> okay. 뭐 그런 거 물어봐. <웃음> 생각, 생각보다 많은 건가요? 좋은 건가? 모르겠네. 예, 네, 다시 한번 좋은 강의 감사드리고요. 예, 네, 박수. 어. 가불, 마치기 전에 가불 선생님한테 감사패 증정하는 시간을 잠시. 아, 시상은 저희 회기원의 회장님께서 해주실 거고요. 제가 감사패 내용을 좀 읽겠습니다. Flag of appreciation, Dr. Won Gabriel Jong. In recognition of your excellent lecture and valuable advice, all of the members of SCPE would like to express our sincere appreciation for your continuous support and guidance. We hereby take a great pleasure in presenting the appreciation flag to you. Uh, Sang Hyun Bak, MD. <웃음> 네, 박수로 확장해 주십시오. 네, 감사합니다. 그럼 3시 20분까지 커피브레이크 하겠습니다.